Gracious God, we thank you this day for your word and uh, grateful God that um, nothing, nothing keeps you from coming alongside of the needs of your people, not tears, not locked doors, not doubts. God, thank you for your presence and your provision in the gift of your spirit and the hope that is ours in Christ. Lord, thank you as well for the commission that you give us to be people that don't just believe, but live a life that changes and remakes us. God, help us to be the hope for a nation that is caught in fear, that is caught with with deep scars and wounds. May we be the hope that it can be found in Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Frank. Um, As I end our Facebook stream, if you want to bring up the PowerPoint presentation. Sure. All right. Got it. Her nice. Okay. Um, and I'll let you go ahead and introduce as we move forward with them. Um, this set of questions from Dr. Jeff. Sure. Uh, as, as you all know, what we've been doing, uh, our acting general secretary, Jeff Woods, has uh, put together um, a, a wonderful piece of reflection for us about talking about the learnings as well as the opportunities coming out of this pandemic. And we've been Uh, In subsequent weeks here, been working our way through that document, looking at the different sections. And today, uh, we want to be able to do that around some of the learnings for our society as well. Um, And I always love love to start with this particular quote. It's one of my favorites. uh, And I think it really fits well coming right off the heels of that devotion. Uh, Man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. I mean, if you sit in a harbor all day long, you're not going to be able to discover very much. I mean, you may be able to fix nets, you may be able to play with your compass, but you're not going to be able to really discover new shores. And the same thing is true for us. It's very simple, very, very natural for us to get so caught up in the challenges of day-to-day life in the midst of this pandemic that we lose uh, the opportunity to see the bigger picture. And that's really what our hope is in providing these times for us to to be able to have dialogue with one another, um, to, to hopefully resource one another, but also to perhaps be able to think in a different way uh, about some of the challenges that we're facing. And as I said, uh, today, uh, we want to look at what Jeff has uh, called out as some of the discoveries for society, uh, and then um, hopefully have some conversation about it, and we'll see how it goes, right? Uh, the, uh, the first uh, piece that Jeff raised up under that particular section is that congregations are impacted, yet resilient. And he says the following. He says, congregations with no available expertise and pent-up resistance towards streaming worship services have done just that. While larger congregations already had the production equipment for an online presence, smaller congregations with little or no equipment have engaged their members electronically as well. The sampling of worship services that I, Jeff, view each week have grown in quality and the ability to connect with participants. Most congregations are reporting increased attendance. Some reports are fivefold of previous numbers. While church buildings remain closed, the church itself expanded. For many congregations, given, giving has remained at a sustainable rate. Not all impacts, however, are positive. While 81.2% of U.S. congregations have been able to launch an online worship service, according to the Pew Research Center, that means that nearly one in five churches have not been able to do so. In terms of giving, a survey conducted by the National Association of Evangelicals showed that 65% of the 1,000 congregations surveyed had seen some decline in giving since mid-March. Overall, 34% of churches have seen a drop of 10 to 30%. 22% have seen a drop of 30 to 75%. 
and 9% have seen a drop of more than 75%. Churches with substantial income through retail space have also been highly impacted. And so coming out of that, the, the question to be asked is, how has your congregation displayed resiliency during this global pandemic? And as you're, as you're thinking that, and as Mark has kind of opened up the, the microphones, uh, we certainly have seen it. Holy cow. Uh, we have, have just been amazed by the resilience of congregations. I mean, we talk to you about streaming stuff. I mean, ad nauseum for many of you in the you know coming months up to this pandemic. And we got often kind of a stiff arm that folks were like, nope, our folks will not go for that. They will not buy that. And yet here we are finding ourselves uh, with congregations that have done some significant work in the area of online presence and some very creative stuff. And so uh, it, it's just been a real blessing to my heart to see the resilience of leaders and the resilience of congregations. So any comments, any thoughts around that particular issue? Anyone want to share how the journey has been as they've launched into going online um, and how you're moving forward at this point? Well, Mark, as I shared with you when we were working on our grant request, one of the things I challenged the folks was that we prepare to go online. That was the beginning of March. I believe the council meeting at the beginning of March and there was no interest in doing that because we don't need it. Um, three weeks later, that's where we are. So that's that's the closest I've come to a told you so. <laughs> I was almost going to say the exact same words, Pastor Doug. It would have been a really good moment to yeah. say, yeah. I told you so, because I remember sitting with you at the diner with Fred Ewald and you telling me, Mark, they, they shot me down on this one. And then two, three weeks later, it was the only option. It was yeah. just so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is as close as I've come to the I told you so. But it's been interesting because folks have actually have, have surely seen the benefit. And it looks like they're even going to be adding a uh, mobile app to the, <laughs> to the whole process. So. Nice. And... Thank you, Pastor Ron um, from Victoria uh, from yeah, Victoria Chapel in Springfield. Um, I've had a chance to be in on some of the services. You've really done an outstanding job, um, both with online sermons and with Bible study meditations during the week. You really have done an outstanding job. It's been fun. Others, At I don't first, know if anyone, go ahead. At First Baptist uh, Pittsburgh. We've actually been back at the church for the last three Sundays. Um, we sort of are one of those perfect scenarios for trying it out, I guess, because we have room for 600 and attendance of 33. <laughs> so we can distance pretty well. Uh, we've done a lot of work on what other kinds of things needed to change in the service as far as communion and, you know, holding hands. <laughs> greeting each other, all of that. Uh, so far, it's gone pretty well. We have incorporated, we're, we, we are still now videoing the whole service, which is available later in the day online <clears throat> on YouTube through our website. And then we're also running a Zoom into the service for those who didn't feel ready to come back yet. We've had some challenges on that, uh, just in terms of sound quality and whatnot, but we're trying. And we even had our annual meeting on Sunday after church and had about four or five of our uh, strong leaders, but who are not yet back at church, able to participate through the Zoom, uh, Zoom experience. Um, I think that's about it, except to say we've been real blessed during the time that we were off 
uh, not able to meet in the church with someone who was able to put together uh, recorded elements of the service and make it look pretty, pretty nice and have it ready for Sunday morning at the regular worship time. And so now we're, now that we're back, we're just recording us live and then, and then loading it up. But uh, yeah, the people have been pretty, you know, when you consider that we have a average attendance of maybe 50, to have 35 coming back has been pretty good because some of our older folks, as I said, are not ready to do that yet. But we feel like we have not lost um, steam, lost people too much. But uh, yeah, so that's what's going on with us. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Pastor Ruth. <clears throat> um, also, it was funny, um, if you were to look on our Facebook page uh, yesterday, I was at the Whitehall Baptist Church for a search committee meeting, and they had on their front sign that they had done parking lot church with an FM receiver, uh, FM transmitter rather. Um, and they still had signs up that they were gonna continue to do parking lot church uh, drive-in church for anyone who wasn't comfortable coming inside the building. Um, so I don't know if any of you have experienced that or other ways besides um, some of those more complex technological solutions to meeting. And I think, Frank, you preached at one of those, right? At um, I Westgate. I did. I got a bucket list check off <laughs> on that one because I always wanted to do that. Uh, and it was quite an experience. And uh, they have been trying to pull the folks that are there at the church about moving back inside now that things have loosened up a little bit. And quite frankly, the folks want none of it. <laughs> They're loving being outside with their FM transmitter. And uh, now it's going to be stinking hot on Sunday. We'll see if that changes the tune or if people just run their cars and run their air conditioners uh, during the service. But no, it was a great experience. And I actually even challenged Pastor Zimmerman. I, I said to him, because uh, we talked about his experience, and I said, so, I said, uh, next summer, are you coming outside again? And he kind of looked at me funny. He was like, we haven't thought about that. I was like, hey, why not? So, yeah. Yep. Exciting. I think um, April, um, Glunt, there, Mill Creek also did a drive in, and she was telling me, I don't think she's on the call, but um, how at various points in the service, they had people beeping their horns and affirmation or using their, maybe you told me that too, Frank, using windshield wipers as a, as a sign of communication, turning on flashing headlights and being really uh, innovative with using your car as a means to interact uh, was pretty fun to hear. Anyone else have any thoughts about resiliency? Um, some of you set up some pretty, I heard an interesting statistic in a webinar, um, that some food pantries are actually struggling with an abundance of food because so many pop-up food pantries have happened in small communities. So major distribution <laughs> sites haven't had as much demand because some of you like threw something together lickety split to take care of your community. Anyone do that? Wow, I heard that. I'll tell you what, Mark, let's slide to the next one then. Uh, the next piece uh, that uh, Jeff raised up was uh, around the healing of the earth, which almost is counterintuitive in some ways. Uh, it, you know, the, you can see by the slide is lockdown uh, helping to heal the earth and, and he, he shared the following. He said, uh, 
we can heal the earth. Los Angeles recently reported that they're experiencing some of the cleanest air on earth, a fact unfathomable just a few months ago. Cleaner air, rivers, and oceans are all welcome byproducts of this pandemic. While the state of the environment did not prompt the cleanup, we have answered the question of whether or not humans could ever turn around decades of creation de degradation with a resounding yes. Will the answer to this question now work its way to the center of our discussions rather than remaining as a byproduct? Dennis Johnson, author of To Live in God, Daily Reflections uh, with Walter Rauschenbusch, recently identified one of his favorite passages from the book, quote, for the present we are here, close quote, which begins, quote, this earth is not is even now the habitation of God, and it is ours to make it wholly so. It is not a place to be spurned, but a home to be loved and made clean and holy. And so you know, coming out of that, again, that's some of Jeff's experience. And I, I've seen the, the reports from not just here in the United States, but literally from around the world in some places in China where uh, you could not see the skyline of the city ever because of pollution. And yet the sky was crystal clear and you could see the skyline because of the lockdown that this pandemic has caused. So a question coming out of this, uh, how have you experienced a, a cleaner environment? I can say for me personally, I say I had the same tank of gas for over a month. And so I know I helped to keep the carbon footprint down um, just by my car sitting in my garage. And uh, Mark and I continue to keep the carbon footprint down because we're not traveling nearly like we did. Any thoughts on that? Has anyone seen more wildlife as a result of people staying at home? Has anyone experienced that? I've certainly noticed it more. Now, whether it was there and I wasn't noticing, uh, one thing that this time has prompted me to do was to, um, to be more involved with being outdoors and with my garden and so, a cleaner environment, um, not sure, but at least a better one <laughs> mm. and more in touch with nature and in God's world out there. My office has moved to the covered back porch and that's been a very pleasant kind of change. Mm. Mm. on three different occasions now and not in the same locale. Um, I had to s bring my vehicle to a stop because fawns have been crossing the road and they are just the cutest things. They must have just recently dropped. They're super small. Um, but I don't know if wildlife got accustomed to crossing the road more often. Maybe they would have been there anyways, but with the lack of traffic, and it was funny, on two of those occasions, one, it was an UPS driver, another was some other delivery truck. We both stopped on either well, side, so either lane to allow the fawn to cross the road. So I was trying to decide with the lack of traffic over the last three months, if some wildlife just got thinking, so it's a little easier to get across the road? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I find it fascinating, too, the number of people that have taken up gardening that uh, hadn't done it before. I have my oldest daughter is one of them, and uh, it's been interesting to get text messages from her and say, so, Dad, how deep do you plant carrots? Uh, you know, do you thin carrots? Right? So all those kind of questions from a person that I thought never would start a garden. But yeah, I think that there's, there has been a, kind of a, a side a benefit, if you would call it that, is just a, a greater connection with creation. Because we, you know, we were so uh, limited in the amount of travel into it that when we've been able to be in it, like Doug said, to be on your porch is just 
such a joy, such a joy to be able to be outside again. Yeah. I know. Is, uh, go ahead. Uh, this is uh, David. Uh, and I think one of the ways we've experienced that is, is the opportunity to discover some different uh, preserves uh, that uh, were not, maybe we were, I, maybe I was aware of one or two of them that they were there. I had been to them once, <clears throat> but hadn't availed uh, taking a walk and, um, and uh, you know, experiencing creation in that way. Uh, and and giving that opportunity to my children, uh, so I think that's uh, because the of the lockdown and because of the pandemic. You know, getting outside in nature was one of the things we could do uh, and socially, stay physically distant from other people, and, and that was one way we experienced it and and uh, saw a lot of other things along the way. Uh, I have to confess, unlike Mark, who was able to stop for a fun on the way to one of these nature preserves, there was a snake crossing the road and uh I, I did not have time to stop my van and die. <laughs> and uh snakes don't slither across the road I don't know. they kind of jump across the road um anyway so I felt really bad for that but then I thought well it wasn't there when I got back so I guess a turkey vulture or something some kind of scavenger had lunch so <laughs> gotcha I, and I, I've heard, I know, uh, Pastor Rob Rice has mentioned, Pastor Randy Powell taking their kids on hikes as well, um, Pastor Dave, and having a great time um, enjoying some of the either parks or preserves. Yeah. Great. Good. This one, this one when, I, when I read it, when I first received Jeff's um, monograph, I just sort of smiled to myself and said, this is so Jeff, because Jeff is a statistics kind of a guy. He's just, uh, it's talking about mammoth nodes. And uh, I absolutely have to read his comments for us to be able to even talk about what it means. He says, nodes are points of connection. They may be individuals, groups, or organizations. Several years ago, I poured through the predictions of Albert Laszlo Barbasi in his book, Linked how everything is connected to everything else and what it means for business, science, and everyday life. And I've recently watched many of these things come, through, come true. In his book, he describes how certain nodes have the potential to become gigantic because so many nodes pass through the same connection link with one another. Companies like Google, Zoom, Chegg, and Amazon are fulfilling Barbasi's predictions. While the stock market has seen steep declines, some companies have grown in capacity during the pandemic portion of the growth is based upon the organization's ability to attract constituents, especially during crises. This theory has also has implications for congregations. It does not mean that smaller congregations are doomed, but it does mean that larger congregations and organizations have some built-in advantages during times of crisis. Laura Everett of the Massachusetts Council of Churches expressed this fear, quote, I'm terrified that we will come out on the other side of this and there will only be wealthy churches. There are wealthy congregations with strong financial reserves and the ability to survive even COVID-19. Then there are smaller struggling churches whose members now and in generations past have been held back by racial and economic injustice. And the question, and it's kind of a multi-layered one, one both in society in general, but then also kind of trying to grapple a little bit with some of those comments that Jeff made around the, the impact upon the church. What groups in your community have been able to grow even during this pandemic? And I think we've all said, right, man, I wish I would have invested in Zoom. <laughs> if I'd have only known. Uh, so, uh, what what groups in your community have been able to grow even during the pandemic? And do you do you agree with some of the comments made about um, larger churches and smaller churches in the midst of this? I'd be interested to hear that. Hear your thoughts on that.
congregations and businesses in town that have chosen to extend their outreach during this time have done well. Uh, one little diner in town decided when they weren't able to open and they had food that they were going to feed the community. Uh, they gave out around 39,000 meals over six weeks. And that little diner uh, is going to much more than survive. In fact, the loyal customers there have exploded. Mm. Um, congregations that have reached out and become more engaged with their community rather than more internally concerned have really seen a difference in this area. Mm. Mm. Thanks so much, Doug, for that. And and just a thought, an add-on, kind of bouncing off of what Jeff Woods had shared. He was talking about sizes of congregations in terms of numbers of people within those churches. What I heard you say, however, was it's not so much the size of the congregation numerically, but rather the size of their heart and the size of their vision, right? Without that a doubt. Was making the difference yeah. in this. Yeah. And, and it's, as I said, it was for businesses as well as for congregations. I, I think, you know, past, um, Ruth had spoken to this earlier, but some of our congregations that are smaller were a little more nimble and able to adjust faster um, and try some things. And it's also a little easier to resume when you're a little smaller and your space um, allows for distancing. Uh, it seems like I'm, I've been hearing, as I've started to, to either visit or contact some of our smaller churches that said, no, we did fine, we're doing fine. People have been generous in their contributions. We've been able to connect and we've actually, much like Doug said with the diner, we've actually picked up a little bit. I don't know if anybody else had similar either conversations or experience. Our, uh, our daughter, youngest daughter, Rebecca, and her husband, Dustin, uh, live in Virginia, down just west of Dulles Airport near Leesburg. And they attend a very large uh, non-denominational church outside of Leesburg. And they haven't even begun to consider meeting in person again for the very reason you you referenced mark because there's so many of them and they said how how do we say to people oh we can only take this many you can't come and so that they're just going to continue to meet online whereas a number of smaller congregations because of the fact they're they're more nimble size wise are able to return to worship so yeah it, it it's it's almost counterintuitive again, right? Yep. I, I don't know, Pastor Sue, I think, uh, Radel, you're on the call. I know Forrest has gotten back together. I don't know if your mic works, if you want to speak at all to that. Uh, sure. <clears throat> we have um, been in the building now since May 31st. And uh, to be quite honest, um, <laughs> It's a mess. It really is. This has been the biggest challenge um, I've ever had as a pastor. We, um, we have a, a pretty close knit church and um, it, you know, we, we're running the rapids right now. Um, I financially everything's fine and was during the shutdown. Um, but I'm really seeing two extremes of the, you know, the beliefs. Uh, some, some people are very fearful of the virus and um, want more restrictions. And sadly, there is a large number of people who will not come back until there are no restrictions whatsoever. So it, you know, it's been tough to um, maintain some or trying to find some kind of balance. And then with the governor's new orders yesterday, um, well, I'll just share that up until yesterday, 
um, the restrictions put into place for us have been masks um, in and out are encouraged. Uh, social distancing in the church has been um, hopefully made easier for everyone as we uh, taped off every other pew. Uh, we are not sharing any food. There's no coffee pots, a very limited surface areas. You know, we tried to do all that so people can just come and worship and leave. Um, we encourage all visiting to be done in the parking lot at six at a, a distance of six feet. And um, it's been a challenge to get people just to do that. And uh, since the order yesterday, I did make a statement last night that we are now requiring masks in the church. And I'm telling you, I'm still reeling from mm -hmm. all the messages I've gotten. Um, very angry people, very angry that, um, you know, that, that people just refuse to wear a mask. And um, I've tried just about everything that I can to... Uh, explain why we feel this is important and that we, uh, I, you know, I believe that it's our obligation to protect the most vulnerable. And um, it, it's been rough. I'm not, not going to lie. Uh, it's, it's been a very rough road. Thanks for sharing. Mm. Sure. What part, what part of the state are you in, Sue? Um, my church is in Clearfield County, so we are about an hour west of Penn State. Okay. So, you know, overall, the numbers have been fairly low and, mm -hmm. and you know, staying low. But, you know, the green, once we went green, um, I live in Mill Hall, about 45 minutes away from my church in Clinton County. And so I'm seeing both, you know, both communities. And uh, everybody threw caution to the wind. And, and I say everybody, um, most people threw, you know, I, I stood in a line yesterday at a store, at a deli, and the two people, uh, there were two of us wearing a mask in the entire store. And now this was in the morning before the governor's new announcement. And two people in front of me at the deli were discussing their trips to, to Dewey Beach. And they had, um, they weren't together. They were friends that hadn't seen each other for a while. And uh, the, the woman said, oh, I was there on the weekend. And the man said, oh, my family was there last week. And I just slowly backed my cart away because uh, obviously they didn't see the announcement that anybody that had visited Dewey Beach or Rehoboth were to get tested because there was an outbreak there. And they weren't wearing masks. I mean, it, it, it didn't even come up in conversation. So, so I think that we're seeing um, a resurgence in numbers. Um, you know, and and I'm one of those that I I think sometimes numbers can be inflated in the news and all that stuff. Uh, and I believe things become politicized. But I'm a firm believer that the virus is real. The virus is killing a lot of people, and that we should be very cautious and. I just see that people aren't being cautious at all. Thank you. Yeah. So this is uh, David, and uh, I know you're not alone in facing that struggle uh, er earlier last night and today uh, on the APCOPAD Minister's Council page, another one of our colleagues had, had, had asked, um, if anyone knew how governor's, the governor's order would uh, affect church goers wearing a mask in a church service. And uh, he, I had responded that, you know, wearing a mask is a, you know, is a great way to love others because uh, it's protecting, I'm protecting others from me in case if I have the virus and don't know it. Um, and, and he just responded that out in rural Pennsylvania, you know, there are people who will not wear a mask and would stay home rather than comply with the order. Um, and, and he questioned about, you know, how do we meet spiritual needs when the church is splintered over things like masks and physical distancing. And uh, it's a very challenging uh, place to be uh, with that. And, and I had just responded to him that I, I heard that challenge and encouraged him that this was maybe an opportunity to try to 
reframe it away from the politic politicization of it to how how we can um, practice you know practice our spirituality by loving our fellow church members and and I think has been brought up another time on this call the first Corinthians passage is things may be permissible but they're not, not beneficial always so uh, I'll uh, keep you in prayer and others that are facing that uh, challenge uh, with people uh, in your congregation and, and that difficulty uh, thank you and I think even beyond uh, the straightforward COVID issues as the epidemic of racism becomes more and more uh, obvious, it's also becoming a wedge issue in congregations. Um, I had a long conversation today about how do you, how do you balance all that? And Frank, maybe we want to move to those slides because I think that's a good segue to, yep. Do you want, Mark, in your thought, do you want me to move to the one on injustice, I think racial so. injustice? Both Why don't we do that? Because it's, we've okay. only got, what, it's four o'clock now. Mm -hmm. uh, let me get the thing back here. So let me slide to that to the last one. And I think the topics are linked. So yep, I do too. Um, and again, one of the learnings that Jeff had mentioned, now remember this was written prior to the incident with George Floyd. So this was prior to that, that Jeff was, was uh, lifting this up. Because you, as you remember, there were higher uh, cases amongst African American community. And there was also the issue of um, blaming Asians for the virus. So um, that's kind of lays at the, at the foundation, but you're, you're right, Doug. I mean, th there are other, other issues that certainly relate. So let me quickly read this and then we can chat about it. Um, a pandemic has the power to shed light on both the courageous and inspiring as well as the cowardly and disturbing. In a recent study, the CDC found that 45% of in individuals for whom race or ethnicity data was available were white compared to 55% of individuals in the surrounding community. However, 33% of hospitalized patients were black compared to 18% in the community. In terms of causes, they further report that, quote, health differences between racial and economic groups are often due to economic and social conditions that are more common among some racial and ethnic minorities than whites. In public health emergencies, these conditions can also isolate people from the resources that they need to prepare for and respond to outbreaks, close quote. Yet, minorities are also disproportionately on the front lines. Hispanic people form 53% of the agricultural workforce in the U.S., white, while Black and African-American individuals make up 30% of nurses. Historic efforts of prejudice and discrimination have been aggravated by this global pandemic. A recent ABC USA press release also highlighted other forms of racial injustice. Quote, many Chinese as well as Asian Americans who are mistakenly perceived as Chinese have been harassed and even physically attacked. The resurgence of xenophobia in this time of coronavirus has no place in the United States or even around the world, close quote, says the Reverend Florence Lee, ABHMS's National Coordinator for Asian Ministries, which is part of the ABHMS Internet Intercultural Ministries. Quote, we stand with our Asian American communities and encourage followers of Jesus Christ to reflect on the Apostle Paul's teaching of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in the spirit, one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. Um, and again, that was, that was what prompted the question, what racial disparities have you been made more aware of as a result of COVID-19? And those are certainly true. And we, you know, we've seen that evidence. But I, you know, Doug, to your point, what a time in the, in the midst of a moment when our, our culture is at a ragged edge with anxiety right now over this virus. To, to have this piece around racial injustice to be brought into that mix uh, 
and, and say in some ways to groups like congregations, okay, now you need to deal with this too, right? Is um, just overwhelming. Um, and um, Pastor John, um, Harris, I, I don't know if your microphone is working, but I know you pastor a, an African-American church relatively close to Philadelphia, um, which has been a hot spot. Do you, do you want to speak to this? How has this impacted your church? And I, again, I don't know if your mic is working. Sorry if I'm yeah, calling you out. <laughs> no problem. Well, um, there's been the support in working together with congregations of other ethnic backgrounds and racial backgrounds. And so we've worked with uh, white congregations as well as Ethiopian congregations for the common good of our community. Um, but on the flip side of that, you have, we've seen some uh, backlash from more conservative churches who don't see why we're feeding people who are Muslim or as one pastor referred to them as terrorists mm. who were uh, people from like Islamabad and different places who live here. And we, pro we provided food for children when the schools let out before the school mm -hmm. district decided to provide food. And we did that collaboratively, white churches, black churches, mixed churches, whatever. And so it shows the awareness of Americanized Christianity and how mm. we're not obviously serving the same Jesus. Mm. <laughs> so that for me has been a reality and just reading some very, I hate to call them conservative, but extremist commentators in religion who their speech is more hateful than that of trying to work together to get through something that doesn't affect liberal or um, progressive or conservative, but this pandemic, this virus is affecting everyone mm -hmm. in one way or another. And so it's just all of our fight has come uh, from the conservative, more conservative fundamentalist churches who are all about themselves, almost cultish, and they worship the emperor, the <clears throat> president, yeah. rather than Christ. And so we've, we've used that as a strategic opportunity to proclaim Christ is Lord, therefore Caesar is not. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's where we've been with the whole thing. But it's been working with congregations mm -hmm. from whether it be uh, PBA congregations or Alliance of Baptist congregations. We've just been working together. Praise God. It's good. And, and I know um, for my own family, some of you know, my family is um, ethnically, racially diverse. Um, and so this has been a, a really important topic in our, in my family. And we've felt the need to, to participate in some of the protests in the greater Williamsport area. And, you know, they've been, um, peaceful and nonviolent, but we've been been present. And I know there are people that are saying, you're supposed to be distancing. And we were masked um, and tried to be careful with how we did that. But um, you could tell there was a lot of uh, questioning about being um, responsible w in gathering. But it's a really important issue for us. And we needed to be in solidarity with our um, African American um, brothers and sisters in Christ in the church that we attend and, and in the community we find ourselves in. Mm. It was just really important to do that. Mm. So, uh, Pastor Harris, where is your church in the Philadelphia area? We're in University City, like 42nd okay. Spruce currently. Oh my, I served at 42nd and Pine. <laughs> okay. And thank, me, thank you for reminding me. I couldn't remember. And forgive me, pa Pastor Harris is relatively new to the Abcapad family. Been around for what, a couple of years now, brother, but um, 
relatively new to the family as opposed to some of us old timers. So I do remember meeting Pastor Harris at one of our gatherings out in uh, out at, at, at uh, out in Malvern. So mm -hmm. yeah. I was just trying to remember where his congregation was located. Having lived at 47th and Pine and 51st and Irving, of course, I'm familiar with that that community. I think the um, pandemic, if you will, has been a blessing in that I'm not sure we would have paused long enough to recognize racial disparity um, or to get involved in understanding systemic racism um, because we would be so busy with our lives, if you will, um, that we're pre-pandemic. Um, I've participated for the last 21 days with a group of 16 to 20 people in a 21 day challenge to understand more about systemic racism. And we've shared uh, a lot of resources, um, both audio and um, video um, documents as well. It has been an awesome experience. And then we've held three Zoom meetings um, where we share with one another. And I can see the group moving forward um, their desire to move forward in a more intentional way um, as a church um, around this issue. So it, to me, I think, I, I thank the pandemic, if you will, because I don't know any of us would have taken the time to do this mm. uh, 21 day challenge mm. without the pause where we're more at home at this point. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sue, so it's interesting that you, you you mentioned what you did about the systemic race racism piece. I was listening to some podcasts this morning as I drove, um, and I listened to them on a regular basis by David Fitch, who's uh, a professor of uh, mission theology at Northern Seminary. Oh. And uh, he does a, a podcast called Theology on Mission. And he also pastors a church in uh, Chicago and uh, that is in Lombard, uh, that is uh, deeply caught up in these issues. And uh, he and I are pretty contemporary age-wise. And he, he made, a, made a comment that uh, honestly I hadn't really thought about. He, he said that for many people that uh, grew up in the 70s and even the 80s, he said there's, a, there's a, a bifurcation when they think about racism, and they often think about racism as a personal matter, and that uh, they kind of define it and go, well, I'm not racist personally, so ergo, racism in my world does not exist. And what Fitch was saying was, well, there's, a, there's this whole other component to it that often doesn't get grappled with and that is the piece that you referenced the systemic Absolutely. racism Absolutely. and the fact that you know for for all of us we have grown up in a in a culture that has acculturated us with issues of racism uh and the, for us as the church we need to to be able to grapple with both of those realities and those that are in, in an anglo setting both with our own personal issues but then also with these realities around systemic racism. And the one pastor that was on uh, the panel this morning is an African-American pastor, again, from Greater Chicago said, yeah, I mean, he pushed, he pushed hard and he said for the church, he said, this is a discipleship issue. He said, and it's not gonna get resolved in our country until it gets resolved in the life of churches. I'm and starting tonight a class with Houghton College. It's an eight week course. It's <laughs> 1,400 and others of my closest friends will be on this webinar. Um, there are those taking it for credit. There are those that are auditing. And then there are those of us who are just going to be on it. Um, and they've had such an incredible um, turnout for this. But it starts tonight for two hours. And it's the American church and racism. Um, American Christianity and racism. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. I have just enjoyed this 21-day uh, challenge so much in the uh, and, and I think there'll be more about this coming out that we'll be able to share with you and, and perhaps be a role model for even churches in Abcopan. Thanks. That's Thanks. good. Yeah, question, the question I have is how do we, 
how do we raise the issue and the awareness in congregations where any where we're so fragile that any thoughts in the area of racism cause people to feel like it's being shoved down their throats. And, and I'm trying to, trying to remember, Doug, if I had shared this resource off of the Facebook page or not. I know I shared it with the members of my LLC. Uh, nationally, uh, when we had had the mission table discussions around the biennial. I don't know if you participated in those or not. Uh, they, they used a document called Baptist Talk. Okay. That is a, a model for uh, kind of a guided discussion around uh, challenging topics. And it had been um, kind of reframed to begin to address issues of racism on a local church setting. And, and the reason that it got brought up at my LLC was Kelly Legg at uh, West Shore was desirous to engage with people at, at that congregation. And so we got talking about it and started to share some resources. So it, I'll, I'll take a look at the Facebook page to see. I thought, I, I thought I'd made a link there. If not, I'll be more than happy to do that. Uh, Thank you. Put that up there. Sure. And there was also another, another page, and I know I put this one up, uh, that James McJunkin had referenced uh, a website that again had some uh, guided conversations starters for for uh, for congregations that that might be helpful to try and get at some of these realities. So, but I'll I'll take a look back to, about the Baptist talk piece. Was Dr. Fitch the speaker at the biennial last year, Frank? He was at the breakfast. I thought so. Okay. Yeah. I recognized the name and, and was so impressed with him. Yeah. I'll have to, we'll have to look that up. Yeah. He's, he did, uh, he's done two weeks now on, mm -hmm. on the topic. And it's just fascinating because again, he's a 60 something yeah. and his co-host is uh, early thirties. Mm -hmm. And he was talking again with another early thirties, mid thirties, uh, African American pastor. So, I, I don't I don't know that this gets to the issue of um, systemic racism, but um, one of the things I I'm grateful for the ethnically diverse family in which I live and and so um, have grown accustomed to people who look different. None of us have the same skin tone. Um, and it's funny, I think it's been super helpful for for me as I've done mission trips in other cultures and have grown to to really see people that look different and and worship different than I do um, to see them as brothers and sisters in Christ via mission trips and just spending time in the presence of of other folks um, who look look different but are have become so beloved uh, and I and I, I I gotta believe one of the ways we begin to overcome this is just by being present with our brothers and sisters in Christ in other cultures. And you don't have to go on a mission trip to do that, right? I mean, you can go to the church down the road and begin to develop those relationships and how we get people to begin to spend time and have those honest dialogues um, with people that look different than us. Um, mm -hmm and be, learn to be comfortable with that and learn that that's okay um, I think is really important. I, I, I think the church has some solutions. It's just we haven't availed ourselves to those opportunities. I, I think it was um, King who said the most segregated hour on, in, uh, during the week is Sunday mornings. That's horrible. That's terrible um, that we still don't interact with one and folks of other ethnicities of other cultures so pastor doug in my mind the more time we spend with folks and i know your church has gone on mission trips and have been with people of other ethnicities i i think that's important and how you increase that is significant thank you sure Doug, I think, you know, one thing is to, um, 
you know, I know my job is to listen uh, when it comes to understanding um, racism and systemic racism. And in order to be able to listen, I have to do the spiritual work to drop my defensiveness. And uh, this term, I haven't read the book, but white fragility. Um, so you know, that's one way to help people, uh, be, you know, those that are feeling like it's being shut down their throat, right? Like kind of go at it from the flank, right? Instead of attacking it directly, you know, um, talking to them about these other, other practices that need to be brought in there because that's what, for my journey towards being an advocate for racial justice and, and addressing racism, is is that I I've had to learn to listen, and uh, in order to listen, I need to not be defensive. And, uh, and I think I did a lot of work at in my last church setting to uh, try to cultivate that that discipline, that practice. Um, and uh, in this past weekend, I I was asked, you know, should pastors be political? It's like, how can pastors not be political? Um, it's how we do it that matters. Um, uh, but anyways, that might be a, a way to get people to engage or just to preach on privilege and what is privilege. I remember preaching a sermon on uh, I Don't Care uh, out of uh, Andy Crouch's book, um, uh, one of his most recent books, and it was this idea of you know, I don't need to know. You know, that, that's a privilege if I don't need to know. But the reality is that we don't, our uh, black brothers uh, and sisters and other minorities cannot not know because that's their lived experience. But our privilege right. is to walk right. away from it. So, anyways, just some thoughts. I just wanted to say quickly. Um, that book, uh, White Fragility, actually, I'm in the process of reading it now. Um, uh, here in Scranton, the Greater Scranton MLK Commission, we were invited to participate in a discussion about that book. And I just got it like two days ago. And the discussion was last night. And, and, um, and it was mostly white people on a discussion. It, you know, and really listening they had read the book and it really opened their eyes to so many things that they didn't even realize that they say that they do um, regarding, um, uh, you know, racism and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that I'll say, um, and I didn't even realize this myself until uh, Kathy Hardaway had mentioned it to actually to our massage therapist. She went, the day before I went, and um, and so that was, and I went yesterday, and she mentioned to me that Kathy had said to her, because at my job, you know, my regular job, I'm a probation officer, so I work in the criminal justice field, um, and I was the first African American probation officer that they ever had. Um, and one of the things that she said uh, to our massage therapist, she said, she goes, Val always talks to me so much about how people at her job come to her. They're Catholic, they're all kinds of different faiths, but they come to her when something's wrong and they need prayer and, you know, and they're, would you pray for me? And da 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 And she, you know, she, and of course, she was like, sure, no problem. She said, but not once have I heard her mention that any of them have asked her, she's okay since this whole thing's happened. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize it myself until it was said. And I thought, wow. And it really made me, you know, really, you know, take a look and just be like, wow, that's very true. Because I didn't even realize it myself. And Kathy never talked to me about this. And we talk all the time. Um, and one of the things, but, but I'll say this. So one of the things that have happened since this whole thing has um, been uncovered because me being a black woman in America, I've known this was, has been happening for decades. And we talk about it in my whole house, my family, my mother, and all of them are from Florida. 
Uh, they lived in the segregated South. So, you know, they really have instilled a lot of things within me. Um, but I could say this, I know Sue reached out to me and just said, hey Val, how are you doing? Or I love you and different people have reached out and said, I just want you to know that I love you. And I've appreciated that. But I, but I myself, sometimes I think that we get so desensitized to things that we don't see it ourselves. And I, I didn't realize it until somebody mentioned it to me yesterday. So I think that listening is very important. It's extremely important and trying to learn and trying to get a better understanding um, about racism and what, like, like somebody has said, because I don't know who's saying what here because I'm on my phone, but um, like somebody has said, it's something I live with every day. It's something I face every day. The little comments, the little things that are said, the little looks, the little comments. Driving to church, every time I drive to church, I have to walk, drive past a Confederate flag, which just drives me completely insane. And then I have to get my mind and my spirit right in order to walk up into church. Um, so I think that listening and trying to learn and being transparent and not, and not being defensive when something is mentioned, because if it's, if it's great in you the wrong way, maybe that's something that you need to look at within yourself. So I just want to say that, and I'm glad that we're talking about this. I had no doubt that the region would talk about it, um, just knowing the spirit of the people. Um, but it's going to be a very difficult conversation, but it's a very necessary conversation. Okay, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Thanks, Fred. I, I just want to say thanks, Val, for speaking up. I was hoping that you would. And I think that um, you know, as a, as a white person, um, I, I think we should be having and starting these conversations by, um, you know, talking to our, our friends and our family members of color. And, you know, we could start with, how are you dealing with this? How are you doing? And then, and then, um, like the, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at who was speaking earlier, um, becoming a listener, becoming a student and, and, just trying to understand better. And I think doing that a little more. I know that it's up to me and I feel this way. It's not up to Val to uh, defend herself or explain herself. It's up to me to not tolerate any racism in my, um, in my presence. It's about trying to educate people. And I've, I've done that all my life. You know, I was very blessed with having a family, a, pa a parent that, um, we had people of color in my family growing up, you know, all the time. And, uh, you know, what a, what a blessing that was. So, um, but, you know, for women in ministry in our region, um, our, Val wasn't able to be on the last call. But before that, you know, I, I gave Val um, a lot of time to discuss with, with the other women that were on the call how she's feeling, right, Val? I mean, that was a really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing this about, I'm not tooting yeah, my horn. I'm saying that this is just one thing that we need to be doing. Val, tell us how you're doing. You know, is there anything that we can do? And, and, and you know, I, I hope that Val felt a sense of love and family, um, you know, in, in that moment. And then we had a, um, a, uh, a, a woman of color, join us from Philadelphia this time. And, um, you know, it, it uh, well, that's, it's another conversation for another day, but she was sharing what she was um, going through as well. And it was a, um, you know, slightly different being in a big city, probably, you know, I mean, uh, the, just from hearing the two stories. Um, but I think what, that we need to do this with our friends of color and give them a, a, a chance to, to share the pain that they've experienced. Thanks, friends. I, I do think, you know, we're, we're quite a bit over what we usually do, but I think the conversation's been really important and super healthy. And maybe at some point we need to create some Zoom opportunities to, to work on this more, um, apart from just the COVID issue 
um, but to just try to help one another in the midst of the um, the racial injustice and helping churches, um, pastoral leaders, congregational leaders figure that out. So, but for now, I guess we should probably begin to wrap things up for today. Right. Yeah, and just to let me add too, thank you. Um, boy, every time this group of folks is together, the conversation always goes deep and mm -hmm. uh, grateful for that, grateful for all of you and uh, for your heart for the kingdom and your heart for one another. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, I tell you what, Mark, uh, you want to you want to pray us out, bub? Sure. Um, and we're going to make the recording available. I hope to have that up and running up at some point, probably tomorrow morning before taking a little uh, vacation time myself. But um, yeah, thank you to all. Let's pray. He Heavenly Father, so grateful for these friends, these partners in ministry, for the continued work that they do in their congregations, in their communities, in their families. Thank you, Father, for um, watching over us in the midst of the pandemic and for knowing that you are always present with us, that we can be bold, we can be um, courageous, knowing that you are alongside us, that you watch our every step, and that whether that's the pandemic or racial injustice, that we can have a voice to care for those that are in need, to support those that are hurting, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the communities and the churches in which you have placed us. Now, Lord, just be with us throughout the rest of this day, this weekend coming up. Um, do, Lord, keep us safe in the midst of the pandemic and help us to be your people wherever we find ourselves. Um, just again, being Christ's hands and feet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, friends. Thanks.